Hello. Thank you for joining our session, How to Build a Data-Driven Business Using Data Analytics. My name is Pam Locke, Vice President of Marketing for IIS, an exclusive HP solution partner in the Northeast, specializing in big data. I will be your host and panel facilitator. This session is an interactive discussion, and I'd like to start off by welcoming our panelists. Jeremy Lehman of Experian. Don Valine, data scientist for IIS. Jeff Healy from HP Vertica. Joel Rubinson, president, Rubinson Partners. Jeff Smith, senior director, business development for IIS's big data practice. Welcome, gentlemen. Shortly, we'll have each of them introduce themselves and share with you their background in this challenging, exciting, and emerging market. However, before we do that, I want to share a goal for this session, and that is to enable companies such as yourself to leverage this knowledge to facilitate a meeting of the minds. Meeting of the minds between IT and lines of business when it comes to big data solutions and its relevant application in business. We find that issue to be one of the biggest challenges for companies as they invest in leveraging data to enable the business, to enable the business to compete more effectively, and to improve customer services and loyalty, ultimately contributing to improved bottom line performance. Our panelists have a lot of experience in this area, so let's get started. Let's meet our panelists. Jeff? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, my name is uh, Jeff Healy. I'm the director of product marketing for HP Vertica, and um, you know I have a real passion for big data, big data analytics, as well as the Internet of Things. And I'm really interested in hearing um, from our, our audience to hear where they're started and where they're getting started with the big data analytics initiatives. And hopefully, we can provide some best practices and experiences. I'm really happy to be here, Pam. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Welcome. Thanks, Pam. So uh, Experian provides uh, data and analytics and digital campaign uh, tools to uh, marketers and government ministries and essentially uh, any client that deals with uh, very large uh, data sets uh, around consumers. And we've been using big data technology uh, as a core element in production on some pretty large uh, uh, business units for, uh, for a number of years and thought we could maybe contribute both uh, some thoughts about what our uh, how our market or clients are using big data, and as well as our own experience on uh, building and operating these products. Thank you, Jeremy. We're delighted to have you today. And now, Joel, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, this is Joel Rubinson. Um, I'm formerly the Chief Research Officer at the Advertising Research Foundation and uh, currently in my own consulting business, and I work with many of the largest marketers and also with solution providers to uh, really help provide a new lean-forward framework for what it takes to create effective and efficient uh, brand growth in a digital social mobile age. Excellent. What a great background. Thank you. Don Valine. Uh, thank you, Pam, and welcome, everyone. Um, my role is Chief Data Scientist with IIS. Um, before IIS, I was with a company called Bysight, a startup in, uh, in Silicon Valley, where we uh, did display ad retargeting, working with a, a whole lot of data, a huge amount of data, and uh, optimizing the, uh, the costs and the benefits for uh, various aspects of that. So my primary goal is to identify and analyze opportunities within big data for our clients across many different industries. Thank you, Don. And Jeff. Hi, folks. This is Jeff Smith. Uh, I'm also from IIS, and I'm the business development manager for IIS. Uh, in my role, I, I assist or, or help build and bring on new lines of business for IIS. About three years ago, we started down the path of developing and building a big data business, uh, focusing on many of the technologies, and we've been in this business now for about three years. So I'm currently leading in the development and the ongoing practice that we're building around big data. Thank you, Jeff. We're really excited today to bring you such an outstanding panel with uh, great depth and breadth of experience in this emerging market. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into our panel discussion. 
so our first question here is how to build a data-driven business using data analytics. And what does that mean to you and your business function? So I'd like to uh, first throw that over to Jeremy and, and get your perspective. Well, uh, you know, data analytics is really the heart of what our business is. We, we enable marketers to increase sales and marketing effectiveness by leveraging data. Well, what we see is a, a fairly broad shift from uh, intuitive to uh, data-driven decisions and processes. Uh, our most successful uh, direct and brand marketing clients are, are getting pretty smart at uh, learning and understanding consumer behaviors, uh, segmentation, and then very carefully matching the, uh, the content, uh, meaning the offer, uh, and creative, along with uh, broader variables like time of day and device optimization, uh, right down to uh, very specific consumers. So it means bringing in uh, broader ranges of data that's integrated, first party, third party, uh, as well as applying a little bit more uh, sophisticated math. So uh, basically, it, it's, it, it's driving organizational changes uh, in many of our clients. We, we see uh, the shift toward uh, the marketing function as opposed to classically dealing only with uh, IT. And uh, we see more cross-pollination between uh, marketing and uh, business. So uh, it, it not only is it fundamental to us, but what we're seeing is that it's uh, driving some fairly significant change in our, our clients as well. Great. Thank you very much. Jeff Healy, I'm going to toss this over to you. Can you talk a little bit about um, the data analytics-driven organization and the impact it has on the different roles in an organization? Sure, yeah, absolutely, Pam. Thank you. So, um, you know, a lot of the customers we speak to that use the HVertic Analytics platform, it's interesting to see um, first kind of external constituents. I think we're becoming, you know, whether you use a wearable device or, you know, your payroll processing company, or even your carrier, um, you want analytical insight. You don't even realize it. But say that, you know, your your daughter is about to approach uh, threshold of the minutes that are going to be used. You want to get alerted uh, before, um, you know, you get the bill shock of, uh, that comes in the mail of the minutes uh, exceeding. So the, all these organizations are, you know, making sure that they're able to handle all this data and get analytic insight that they can go then provide uh, to their external constituents, and they can provide those as services. So that's kind of an external view, but from internally, how to build a data-driven uh, business using data analytics. Um, you know, the CIO wants answers, but needs to understand the opportunity cost of doing nothing. Um, often those initiatives can start from an embarrassing situation, such as missing an SLA for top customers, or uh, even missing a sales number because there wasn't enough insight on the predictability to close a major deal at a quarter's end. So those are some of the answers the CIO wants. Uh, CTO is dealing with that ever-growing stack of, um, you know, technologies from different relationships. Um, so they need to understand which vendor can also meet the internal SLAs. So that's from marketing. It uh, could include support to leadership. And they want to remain open for expansion. You know, as big data grows and grows, they want to be able to make sure that they can handle uh, the massive volume and variety. And uh, as Jeremy said, the CMO, you know, marketing – um, is a real consumer of this data, not so much in, in getting involved in choosing analytics platform. In fact, they're less interested in that technology. And they simply want the analytic insights served up in digestible reports, dashboards. Uh, they want to understand the brand perception using social media channels, uh, the lead volume and quality across all their campaigns, really intelligent campaign management, uh, online community metrics and conversion rates, uh, ability to serve up A-B tests and live and, and to be able to drive upsell offers. And then finally, uh, the other main person here who's involved in the technology valuation and uh, adoption is the IT admin the DBA. And uh, you know, basically, they want to sleep a little better at night and accommodate all those backlogs of requests without uh, overtaking the system. Because, again, you know, marketing support, sales, they're all needing those answers, and they're really putting a lot of demand and, and pressure um, on the IT department. So uh, they want to make their life a little bit easier. They want to be able to remain open. They want to choose the right technology that works and integrates with all the great technologies out there like Hadoop. So I think everyone within uh, organization has a role here to play, but the overall goal is really to get that insight from uh, that massive volume of data. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, everyone has a, a, a unique role to play, and uh, we're going to certainly get an illustration of that in a real-time success story. Jeremy, can you tell us a little bit about Experian and how you're leveraging these technologies and the dynamics within your organization, within all of the different uh, roles that are engaged in the big data solution? 
Well, we uh, integrate uh, Hadoop with uh, structured databases like uh, Vertica and SQL Server, and then also use uh, HBase as sort of a, a lightweight uh, tool. Uh, we, we sometimes talk to our clients, and uh, they'll, they'll kind of frame Hadoop versus relational, or they'll think it's a, a, a standalone solution. Uh, it's really not. You, you kind of have to step back and look at it as an integrated whole uh, between uh, Hadoop bringing in uh, large volumes, uh, perhaps less structured data, and then think of that as uh, basically doing pre-processing on MapReduce, and then maybe having um, aggregates go into a, a structured store like Vertica, because ultimately you do need to have uh, some structure to it if you're going to do interactive drill down, root cause analysis, something where a person is going to be uh, involved with it. So there really is kind of a natural fit. And uh, uh, the, the detailed data, then you can reach down into you know, HDFS, into the Hadoop uh, uh, native store when you need to get that. And it's a pretty graceful combination. So in our case, we have about, uh, 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 about 11 billion events a day. Sometimes it spikes a little closer to 30 billion events coming out of uh, digital marketing campaigns. And then we combine that uh, with uh, a pool of uh, attributes around consumers. In North America, we have about 1.3 trillion uh, attributes on demographics and psychographics, things like uh, presence of children, uh, estimated disposable income, et cetera. And that's all used uh, for segmentation and targeting. Uh, those volumes uh, would be overwhelming to probably just about any schema-based relational store. So it goes through uh, Hadoop initially, then into uh, we've used uh, Vertica, uh, SQL Server, uh, MySQL, and others. More recently with Vertica, we did see an initial Forex improvement using, uh, it was basically we just took Oracle PL SQL without a whole lot of changes at all. just wanted to see if it would run. It actually ran and it got Forex uh, faster. With optimization, and the, the results went uh, considerably faster. So uh, it, it does matter, the choice of relational store that you're using there uh, quite a bit. You, you asked the second question, though, that uh, was around the effect on the uh, organization. And uh, probably what I would suggest is, that historically data people tend to come up from a, uh, a data-oriented career path, whereas Hadoop uh, uses Java for MapReduce and tends to draw upon more of a developer uh, uh, career path. So it's the fusion of these two that really becomes uh, much more important. You can't have your database operations people off in one corner uh, not fully aware of what's going on in MapReduce. In this, uh, also, if you're looking at the NoSQL stores like Hadoop, they're a little more brittle, meaning that you have to really find what it is you're doing up front uh, a little more than you do with a conventional database. The database uh, is designed to be flexible. The data formats, the storage, the MapReduce jobs take a little more effort than just putting in another uh, SQL query. So you have to uh, think about that up front and uh, have real tight business alignment uh, with the architects. Uh, and then, again, also, that plays to the strengths of having a, uh, a, a very strong structured store like Vertica so that you don't have to anticipate every single possibility uh, when it comes to uh, feeding the front ends, feeding analytics, and uh, feeding reporting. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what, a, what a great story. Uh, you know, we talked about how big data is enabling the business. In the case of Experian, it is, it is the business. So uh, thank you for sharing. Um, let's drill down now and uh, talk a little bit more about um, how, how should one determine the architecture for structured and unstructured data. Joel, let me toss that over to you. Can you uh, address the audience? Sure. Um, so structured data it is usually referred to uh, structured data is usually data that comes to you in rows and columns. It's data that already is, you know, it's numbers, it's it's already easy to organize. Unstructured data is, you know, very, um, uh, very amorphous initially to deal with because it's pictures in a visual marketing world. It's video. It's it's social media conversation where sometimes the meaning of the tweet is very clear and sometimes the meaning is tough to determine because of sarcasm or slang or something like that. However. You can put structure onto unstructured data 
there are, for example, social media listening platforms that can determine the sentiment of the social media conversation and determine what brand it's about or what what life needs it's about or whether it's about someone about to go shopping or it's about somebody looking uh, for an idea for a vacation or to do something on a weekend. So uh, what you need to be able to do in a big data era is find a way that there's a meta structure that sits on top of both structured and unstructured data so that they can be brought together for harmonized insights. So, for example, for this segment of uh, consumers who we're looking to, you know, make sure they fully get what our brand message is about, uh, you know, from a structured data point of view, we might do a survey, and uh, and from a semi-structured point of view, we might analyze clickstream behavior from people who are identified as falling in that segment. From an unstructured point of view, we might try and identify people who are, for example, tweeting or blogging about uh, a topic that indicates that they're in that segment and really look at the the vocabulary and the, and the meaning behind the vocabulary that they're using. Okay. Thank you. Don, um, please share your perspective. Um, well, uh, I'd echo everything that Joel has mentioned, but uh, one of the key things I think that's very important is that it's becoming more and more important to store almost everything. Uh, it's easier and easier to store more and more data uh, in a structured or an unstructured manner, just putting a lot of that into Hadoop or a similar type system. Once you have that data available, then you can go through and figure out which parts of that data might be important for you at the current time. Um, but what's important at this time might uh, might be different than what might be important in another week or a couple weeks or something. You might need to go back and take a look at some of that data. Again, um, as, as Joel mentioned, you know a lot of this data will be coming in in an unstructured form. Uh, when you're storing it in your data lake or your uh, in your Hadoop cluster, you may just have a, a lot of data. You don't know what you're going to use it for at some point. Do some initial analysis in order to find out what that data is. Um, add some structure to it, um, either by identifying uh, the key fields or, as Jeremy said, uh, adding some aggregations. Um, and then you can put it on into your uh, appropriate either row-based or column-based uh, uh, relational type database. Um, once you've done that, then you can do your analysis with uh, some of the great analytic functions that some of the various products have, as, uh, as well as uh, just do some ad hoc uh, investigations as to what you might think would be important. Um, and then, of course, then you could uh, go into your unstructured data and extract even more um, attributes as you find out that certain pieces are important. Great. Thank you. Jeff Healy, HP's made a huge investment in this space. Um, can you share with us your perspective from from an HP, from HP? Sure, absolutely, Pam. Thank you. Um, I, I think all the panelists here did a very good job of explaining, you know, the various technologies that are involved here. But um, I think it's been a little bit simplified in the industry as far as, okay, structured data is typically stored within a data warehouse or an emerging data on one of its platforms uh, like HP Vertica. And then unstructured data goes in something like Hadoop. Well, I, you know, I'm glad Jeremy uh, provided a little insight into the stack that he has. You're hearing more and more technologies, and the reasons for that is that, um, you know, one, as Don mentioned, you want to be able to store all this information because there's value there, but you want to be able to run analytics against it very, very quickly. So you're hearing more emerging players, like even in the SQL and Hadoop arena. Um, and I think what you're, what you're finding here is there's more tools to be able to explore that very, very quickly, things like uh, HP Vertic Flex Zone. You can explore data like log files or click streams or sensor data that has some structure to it. Maybe it's called, you know, semi-structured data. But you don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, maybe hiring MapReduce programmers to get in a structured format that you can read within a, a column store uh, like Vertica. So uh, with Vertica Flexon, what you can do is you can, you know, uh, bring it in very quickly uh, without defining a lot of schemas. And um, you explore to see if there's value using any BI or visualization environment. And then if you find value within that data, you can promote it with an HR analytics platform to run your um, run your queries or run your analytics against that. So you know, what I'd say is, you know, organizations that are out there that are considering, you know, a structured versus unstructured, it's not just as black and white as Hadoop versus a data warehouse or a relational database or an analytics platform. 
but uh, certainly there's a need for a combination of technologies, and I think you're going to see more integration among all those technologies to make it easier to get that analytic insight uh, very, very quickly. Okay, thank you. All right. What role has unstructured data taken on for most firms, and how does its management differ from structured data? I know we touched on this a little bit, but um, Joel. Well, um, if you think of unstructured data, for example, as um, social media conversation or, you know, what might happen when a customer calls in to a customer care center, uh, basically, Marketing is trying to harness all of this insight because, frankly, it's too competitive out there to be able to create brand growth in an effective and efficient way without mining every potential source of insight that you have that can give you somewhat of an edge in marketing activities and in generating customer experiences that result in in greater sales over time. So virtually every company I know of at this point is, for example, using social media listening. They might be using it for corporate reputation monitoring, or they might be using it in a more structured uh, brand tracking way where they've, they've put structure onto, onto social media information. Basically, um, what it really comes down to is businesses being as customer-centered and consumer-centric as they possibly can rather than putting their own brands at the center of the universe because they realize that consumers are in control. And part of them being in control is they can seek you out whenever they choose to uh, via search and clickstream behavior. They can talk about you in social media. There's all kinds of ways that they can um, – uh, engage in brand conversation that has an impact on you every bit as much as your own advertising might. So unstructured data really has become a, an integral part of the mix today. Okay, thanks. Um, Jeff Smith, you're meeting with customers on a daily basis. Uh, please share your thoughts. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so first of all, and a lot of this has been discussed already, um, you, you there's no sharp distinction between structured data and unstructured data. It's more of a, it's a dichotomy or continuum of data types that an enterprise uses, all the way from structured data that we've spoken about traditionally what you'd find in a database uh, to this notion of semi-structured data that Jeff Healy spoke about, things like JSON files, the exhaust of web uh, activity, uh, events, the exhaust of uh, complex events that are happening in your IT infrastructure and the storage of that. And then at the far end are the truly unstructured data types, things like videos, music, voicemails, and things of that nature. Um, and the point is, is that the goal of an enterprise is to monetize and provide and derive value from those various data sources and those various data types again, to make money. Um, and there is a wide, wide variety of technologies, some of which have been mentioned, to do that. Now, IIS is a, is a large HP partner, and we, we're very focused on the HP technologies, and we've spoken about Vertica uh, on the structured data side. We've spoken about Vertica Flex Zone on the um, semi-structured data side for things like JSON and delimited text files. The other dimension of their portfolio that I'd like to mention on the truly unstructured side is called IDLE, and that's an asset that they acquired a number of years ago from Autonomy, and it's a very, very interesting and powerful technology to understand and, and derive value from truly unstructured data, things like, again, videos, voice, and, uh, and, and, and create and understand the contents of those pictures um, and, again, to, to provide meta-level data that describes the, those unstructured data items. And then once you have that information, uh, using it in a way to, to create uh, value for your enterprise. The other uh, notion here, too, that uh, should be brought up is this, is this idea of dark data. Um, we've spoken about all of the various data types in an enterprise. Uh, many enterprises are collecting data furiously from a variety of sources and throw it into repositories like Hadoop, as, as mentioned, but not many companies know 
uh, much about that data. They're just collecting it. And uh, some of these technologies that we mentioned, or this, this notion of dark data, is that they, they have this data available to them, but they're not monetizing it, not creating value from it. So some of the technologies that we've spoken about are, are useful in doing discovery of this dark data, understanding this dark data, and then trying to create or doing analytics against it to create value from it. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, moving on to our next question. What are the major forces driving investment in big data initiatives today? Jeff Healy, why don't we start off with you? Sure, thanks, Pam. I'd say one of the, the most major forces is the, the companies that we speak to, our customers, each of our customers, is uh, competitive differentiation. So um, you, you look at some upstart companies, say within online gaming or ad technology, particularly ad technology, where um, they view their analytics initiatives as so instrumental to their success of their business that you know, we can't even name their companies. Um, so, you know, take things, I think Joel was talking about clickstream analytics, right? So, you know, within ad tech or online gaming, they want to be able to understand and analyze every single click of every game, um, you know, or how the ads are performing and things like that. So they really view it as a competitive differentiation. Um, I, I think that, you know, some of the larger organizations like the Fortune 500 companies that are, that are out there, you know, they've made major investments in their data warehouses and, they, and they're trying to, you know, in, in some ways doing unnatural things with the data warehouse and saying, look, at the, I've spent millions here. I don't want to throw this away. And you don't have to. But I, I think what we're going to see more is, you know, you're taking one use case, whether that's fraud detection or, um, you know, uh, being able to predict churn or, or things like that, some really big data analytic uh, use cases that are becoming more prevalent. Take those and really look at the technology that you need to get that analytic insight. Not, you know, don't wait a week, don't wait a day. You need that information back within an hour. So I think the forces that are driving there is um, to remain competitive or else, you know, if you don't get into, you don't have analytics as core as your business, you could perish. And you need to look at the existing infrastructure that you have and say, am I going to be able to get that analytic insight that I need from uh, what I have? Or really, is it a combination of technologies? And I think more and more organizations are seeing that. You know, there's a role for Hadoop. There's a role for analytic platforms like Vertica. There's a role for data warehouses. But you, know, you need to make sure that you have the right collection of technologies. But the common driver is you don't compromise on the technology and get that analytic insight right now, or else you know your business could be at risk. Okay, great. Certainly a s secret weapon for today's businesses. Um, Jeremy, can you please uh, share with us your, your thoughts? Oh, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here. Do you uh -huh. hear me? Yep, we can. Thank you. Okay, yeah, want to repeat the question one more time, just uh, since we had that interruption, please? What are the major forces drive, driving investments in big data initiatives today? So you speak with a lot of uh, customers and uh, different accounts, different industries. Uh, from your perspective, what are the major forces that are um, driving the investment in big data solutions? One of the, the really great things about uh, working with uh, digital marketing is you can see a fairly immediate uh, cause and effect uh, on Lyft. If, uh, if you bring together uh, the the consumer insight into seeing what their behaviors are. So, for example, which websites people might go to. If you get your segmentation more precise so they can match uh, content and uh, creative to that, then you can see the results pretty immediately. So the investments are not so much uh, uh, you know, solely strategic investments, but uh, we get very immediate feedback uh, from some of uh, the larger uh, retailers in America. So, for example, there's uh, one client, uh, uh, probably the, the leading purveyor of uh, uh, lingerie and uh, 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 sportswear, present just about all malls in America, and they do about uh, 20 to 30 percent of their uh, business uh, online, in addition to uh, bricks and mortar. So they can see an almost immediate uh, impact uh, when we enable better data or better analytics. Uh, so it, it is a short-term, bottom-line driver. It, it's, it's not just a, you know, conceptual or strategic. It is very immediate. It is day-to-day. -day. And uh, that means that uh, operational uh, stability becomes uh, paramount uh, just as much as anything else because it's so uh, 
uh, core to the heart of their business that if there's any operational issues, uh, they immediately start losing money. So uh, probably the, the best way to phrase it is to simply say that uh, there is a very direct correlation to better use of this data and uh, driving sales right now. Great. Thank you. Don? I think one aspect is um, just the fact that the tools are available now to be able to both store huge amounts of data as well as uh, analyze it, process it, optimize uh, based on it. So a lot of the data that might have just gone out onto, uh, you know, out into the old bit bucket that, that you don't save anywhere. You know, now we're knowing that we should save it. At some point, that information may be available, and then, indeed, we do have the tools. It's not going to take us years to analyze this data. Uh, we can do it quite quickly. Uh, in addition to just the volume of the data and being able to analyze it is the, the near real-time capabilities that we do have with analysis and, and the optimization that goes with that. One other aspect, too, one other force may well be uh, compliance requirements that are necessary in financial and other fields. Um, so you may have a lot of data, dark data, as Jeff had mentioned. You don't really know what it is, but if it's something that's discoverable legally, then it may well be that they find something that, uh, that you didn't, in fact, know you had even in your storage. So it's a, it's, it, it behooves you to go ahead and... Uh, analyze that data yourself so you can make sure that you cleanse it or you analyze it before it ever has to be discovered or something similar to that. Okay, Th thank you. So there's certainly many elements to uh, a big data solution and considerations for structured, unstructured data. So let's dive into what are the major challenges to uh, big data adoption. There's certainly been a lot of uh, buzz about it. Um, Jeff. What are your thoughts? Well, Jeff Smith, I think you went to this too, Jeff. On Smith, yep. But yeah, yeah. So I, I see three major challenges uh, in the adoption of, um, of technologies around big data. One is um, right now in the current state, there, there are great tools to address different domains of the data continuum. There are great tools to, um, to manage and work against structured data sets. There are some tools available to work against strictly unstructured data sets or text-based content. I think the difficulty and the challenge and the way the, the market is evolving or needs to evolve is to develop single sets of tools to address the connection of or connecting structured transactional data sets to unstructured data to text-based content so that um, you can have a, a, a platform uh, that addresses all of the various types of data in your enterprise, and it's easy to work with to, to join these disparate data sets to create value. Uh, the second challenge I see in the market is the lack of skilled uh, users to work with big data uh, tool sets. Um, in, the, you know, in the infancy of big data solutions, it took very specialized pro programming skills to use these tools. Uh, and those types of engineers uh, are, are not a, uh, not a commodity. They're, they're, they're very specialized and very highly educated people that are very expensive, and they're hard to find. Um, I think that uh, those types of skills, as well as finding what I'll quote good math men, people that understand analytics and understand statistics that can actually uh, understand, you know, apply those math apply that math to data uh, are at a premium at this point. And I think that our universities and the industry as a whole have to um, develop and, and, and build more people that have these skill sets to address these, uh, these big data tool sets. I think that's going to be the, the limiting or the gating factor in the growth of these, uh, these technologies in the market. And I said, the, I guess the third concern would be security and privacy. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, doing analytics on Twitter data or doing customer analytics and, you know, implicit, there's a creepy factor implicit in all of that, you know, that, that all of this data that people are collecting from people's phones and, and social pages um, uh, invades, there, there's a question of privacy and invasion of privacy there. So I think that um, people... Uh, 
at some point will rebel uh, against the collection of their private data or want some security or, or, or um, assurances that their privacy is not going to be violated. So I think that's going to s uh, limit um, some of the adoption of te big data technologies uh, in the industry. Thank you. J Jeff Healy, from an HP perspective, you're um, clearly working to, you, you always understand customers' business problems, challenges, to develop your, your, your product set, if you will. Um, what, from your perspective, are the major challenges that you're focused on in HP product development with big data solutions? Sure, I know. Thanks, Pam. So I, I think I'd have uh, kind of two answers for this. One is the, you know, the technology challenge as far as being able to, you know, with each vertical analytics platform, what we see is uh, most of the organizations, once they take the data from some incumbent database or a data warehouse and they put it into Vertica, you know, they see unbelievable results. Um, I know Jeremy talked about 4x you know, performance improvement right out of the game. We see that all the time. So um, what we try to focus on is um, how can we make it easier for organizations to get that data into Vertica so that they can see amazing results, right? So there's a lot of tools out there, ETL tools, and you know, Hadoop has a, a lot of tools out there for um, – you know, ingesting that data. So we're really focused on how can we remove those barriers. So I already mentioned HP Vertical Flex. And the other thing we're doing is um, with, the, with the drag line uh, release is you'll see tighter integration with Hadoop. Now, many organizations just start with Hadoop and they, they actually equate uh, big data with Hadoop because they have these massive volumes of data. Hadoop is very good at being able to store that in a way uh, very quickly so you don't have to add um, a, a lot of schema definition or what have you. So um, we're looking at kind of marrying the best of both worlds with Hadoop with Vertica, right? So you no longer have to consider, oh, how much data am I going to store in Vertica? Is that really, you know, am I storing cold data in there? Or you know, really I want more of my hot data in Vertica because that's where I'm running all my, my queries and my analytics. Uh, I think you see the lines blurred more where if you want to store um, you know, data that you're not necessarily running your analytics against within, say, the last um, 7 to 30 days and you want to keep it for in terms like uh, – your Dom was saying around legal uh, compliance and regulatory reasons, you can do that fine, and you can do it very, very easily. So um, a real focus on SQL on Hadoop um, and tools that enable you to uh, explore and ingest and, you know, get that into Vertica so you can run your analytics very, very quickly. Now, I, I think that's from, a, that's from a technology perspective. I think out in the industry, you know, we have customers that are startups where they have a, a complete analytics-driven mind. Uh, you know, the organizations, you don't have to go and sell them on the value of analytics. They know it. So they need to have an analytics, you know, technology stack in place using the best of breed tools, Hadoop, Vertica, you know, the other tools like Autonomy, uh, because they understand without having that analytics, you know, they could be out of business very, very quickly. Um, you know, Jeremy talked about so, some of those use cases where they can immediately see uh, business value there. Whereas larger organizations, they have a lot of technologies that have been around for 30 or 40 years, and, you know, they can't just go and rip it out and put in what they consider their best stack. So they need to, you know, take more of an approach in seeing out, seeing how, okay, I'm, I understand I can use Hadoop with my existing data warehouse. You know, does Hadoop actually replace the data warehouse? I don't see that happening. You know, where does the analytics platform fit in? So they need to do a little bit more consideration of what that stack is going to look like versus the up-and-comers, which are breathing down their necks, by the way, because they can start from scratch and say, we're an analytics-driven organization from top to bottom, and we're going to use the best-of-breed technologies across the board, and we don't have any legacy technologies that we have to consider. So I, I think Jeff Smith talked about a dichotomy. There's a dichotomy out there as well among, um, you know, a traditional organization that's been around for 100 years and then upstarts. So uh, just a little little flavor there, Pam. Okay. That's, that's great. A lot of wonderful insight. Thank you. Okay. Um, what are some of these data technologies that will add value to business today? Okay, J Jeremy, please please uh, give us your thoughts. Sure. Well, probably the, the initial response is that uh, uh, I think we're getting past the era of a simple, descriptive, backward-looking. Uh, analysis or reporting that simply says what happened. And it's a shift to go from uh, this backward-looking descriptive toward predictive and then even optimizing uh, what's going on. 
and, and uh, you know, that, that's got a number of different axes in terms of uh, the reasoning behind it or the, the rationales behind it. One is an uh, in, in advance in people's comfort levels and understanding of different quantitative methods and uh, a, really a, adoption of more classical uh, machine learning technologies. You know, for many years, that, that concept of uh, artificial intelligence uh, was kind of out of style. And uh, now it's really, it's just revived under different words, uh, you know, deep learning, machine learning, et cetera. And uh, we, you know, that, that is becoming a far more mainstream kind of technology. Uh, I, I was pretty struck by, for example, at HP Discover last week, how uh, in Meg Whitman's uh, keynote with uh, Satya Nadella and the uh, CEO of uh, Intel, that uh, the, there are accounted nine different references to uh, uh, machine learning. Satya Nadella three times, and he was talking about things like emergent properties of neural networks. <laughs> Just loving it. It's just really, really good. It's just great to see, you know, these senior leaders uh, recognizing that these things that have been in some pretty specific pockets of the economy are now becoming mainstream. So uh, in terms of uh, where is their business value, first is getting uh, further uh, uh, in depth on the, uh, the quantitative uh, techniques applied. Uh, probably a, a second one is that people have sometimes launched into big data projects and I think it was Jeff mentioned, they'll say, okay, uh, well, we're going to see what we can do with Hadoop. It was almost like there was a, a tool in search for a problem, and a very specific tool, because it was only part of the problem. It's like saying I'm going to build a car engine, but I only have a screwdriver. Uh, when uh, the, the reality is you still have to have a, a strong grounding in fundamentals. So we're, we've seen a number of our clients uh, kind of do a, a reverb where they start a project to go explore, as it becomes real, and now there's mainstream metrics, KPIs, P&L expectations on them, all of a sudden, the basics around integration, ETL, and data quality kind of come in later on. So while I do respect that there's kind of an attitude shift around big data, that it's as much about starting things a little bit more iteratively, taking on a little risk, exploring, learning as you go along. And that's very positive, much better than you know, uh, trying to do a waterfall approach. But sometimes maybe you have to think about having the integration and the data quality and the data enrichment up front, thinking through the abstraction uh, of how you're organizing the storage and the MapReduce and the data model so it's flexible, and doing that up front as well. So uh, I, just to summarize, I, I'd say uh, two things where we're seeing uh, uh, the, you know, the business value is one is applying uh, more advanced quantitative techniques, uh, and the second is uh, almost the mainstreaming, if you will, of uh, big data, where you see that a group that maybe started with an R&D project on the side is now returning back to making sure that they've got those strong basics in place. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right, let's get to the question that I know everyone's asking. Where will the ROI most likely be realized? Joel, what are your thoughts here? What, yeah, thanks, man. Um, <laughs> what makes big data so exciting is the change in the way marketing can and should be working. You know, if you go back to, you know, 20, 30 years ago in marketing, um, you had very little opportunity to really leverage big data into doing different things from a marketing point of view. For example, uh, it was very easy to put advertising on TV. You, you bought a show and, it, and everybody was watching that show, you know, saw your commercial. So uh, it was mass marketing and it was you know, no differentiation between one person watching you know, All in the Family and, and the person the neighbor next to us watching All in the Family. They saw the same commercial. I believe the future of advertising is programmatic advertising. Programmatic advertising allows you to automate the process where you can buy impressions that are individually addressed to one user and not another user, where you can serve up the most relevant content, the most relevant message to somebody at exactly the right time, at exactly to the right person on exactly the right screen. Big data is the, the knowledge and predictive engine that allows you to do that matching. So the ability to take data coming from all these sources, transactional information, uh, clickstream information, 
social media connected and aligned in various ways as we turn unstructured information into structure and then use it as a lever to figure out which impressions you're going to bid for and uh, how much you're going to bid, you know, that is that is going to turbocharge our uh, ROI. For example, last year or so, Kellogg's announced in a Forbes article that by using pro programmatic ad buying, they got six times the return to their advertising than they got through analog media, through traditional advertising. Six times. So that's that's an, an example of how much more return you can get to your money. So now my belief is that translating data into different marketing action that is precisely addressed um, in ways that make brand content hyper relevant. So people instead of blowing it off and avoiding it, they're they're seeking it out as if it's content that is incredibly valuable to them. That's what the promises of big data translated into programmatic advertising and translated, therefore, into marketing ROI. That's that's where the promise really resides. Um, great. Thank you. J Jeremy, uh, share with us your thoughts on ROI. Well, I think people are going to see ROI in organizations that are organized for it. Uh, I mean, I'd love to get Joel's thoughts on this. I'm sure we deal with uh, similar kinds of clients where uh, we continually come across clients where web marketing is handled by one group disconnected from uh, email marketing, let's say. And that's well before you start taking in point of sale, uh, call center, uh, warranty, every other form of data. And that's uh, even before you would even look more broader to uh, third-party uh, data in uh, co-ops uh, or from places like uh, uh, Experian or Axiom or others. So uh, the clients that really get the best results are the ones who have embraced uh, analytics as you know, key to their business and they're organized as such uh, around that. Okay, thank you. Oh, All I, right, I it's, would time agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's time that we move into uh, some questions. We have um, a few teed up here. Um, one is, is basically about uh, uh, entry point. It, you know, is this a solution only for large enterprises, or can a mid-market um, company get into this? And what is the cost of entry for a solution? Jeff Smith, why don't you take a stab at that? Yeah. So, so the answer is every enterprise can take care, uh, take advantage of big data, and they're. And in the mid-market where expense is an issue or, or the uh, inability to build out large-scale infrastructure internally, there are cloud-based solutions available in the market to do big data analytics and to store data. So I think that uh, as you move down into the mid-market space, you'll see cloud adoption, uh, a greater cloud adoption around big data solutions than you would in the enterprise. Now, of course, um, once you move it in the cloud, some of the privacy concerns and security concerns uh, rear their heads. But I think that uh, in this day and age, the cloud providers have addressed the security uh, aspects and the privacy aspects of their infrastructure quite well. And I don't think that is as much a concern now as it once was three or four years ago in the cloud space. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this next question here would be perfectly suited for our data scientist. Uh, Don, uh, there's a question around unstructured and stru structured data retention life. You know, what, what are the, the rules around how long information should be kept? Well, in, in some industries, there's uh, compliance or regulatory uh, requirements. Um, in uh, the mortgage space, for example, you have to keep uh, your data for the life of the mortgage plus some number of years afterwards, so that can be a 30-year 35-year uh, retention requirement. Um, in other cases, um, you know, there are there are other agreements between people. You know, that there are companies that they'll retain the data for no longer than it's uh, than than perhaps a year or so. And then other companies have their various rules uh, as to their own retention policies. So I, I think it really does depend on the type of data, whether it's personally identifiable, whether it's anonymous data. 
uh, whether it's data that uh, could have uh, legal or other ramifications. So um, I, I did mention earlier that, you know, it's becoming easier and easier to store everything, uh, no telling what data you might need to be able to analyze uh, next week or next month or maybe next year you want to look at your past year's data on this specific attribute that you hadn't thought of before. So perhaps it's a matter of anonymizing data so that you can hold it longer without having to worry about uh, um, going back and identifying somebody specific with it, um, you know, if you're still trying to learn uh, uh, various behavioral patterns or whatever of uh, the population as a whole. So it's a standard answer. Yeah, okay, you thank you. Um, I think one last question before we wrap up. Um, one question here, I am investing in a proof of concept and looking at starting my implementation. What type of resources should I be recruiting and, and hiring? Jeremy, you want, I'll toss it over to you. Which, which, are, which resources are most important for this individual success um, in developing a solution and getting it up and running? I would say it's a combination of the quantitative uh, skills and uh, the uh, uh, business domain knowledge uh, skills, which might be in a, in a BA or a program manager who's not necessarily a technical individual. Uh, the, the broader uh, database and uh, Java elements, I, I think, can be uh, learned uh, fairly readily. You know, I mentioned earlier that in our experience, uh, we literally just cut and paste some uh, uh, SQL, and while I wouldn't necessarily even come close to doing that in a production environment, it didn't take a whole lot to do the initial uh, adoption of uh, Vertica, for example. Uh, so I would suggest that it's, it's really in the, uh, the quant skills and uh, the business domain knowledge that I would uh, concentrate up front. And, you know, by definition, those are probably the harder skill sets uh, to find as well. Uh, but if you are kicking off the project, uh, just to emphasize a point earlier, while it may be a pilot, might be a POC, uh, still do stress having real strong integration uh, and data quality and then uh, that flexible, well-abstracted uh, design right from the get-go so that you don't have to adjust that stuff later on. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. As we wrap up, I um, we want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to share with you their, their wisdom and uh, some final thoughts. Jeff Healy? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so I just have, uh, you know, three points that I want to emphasize is one is uh, don't throw away any of your data. Um, you know, uh, Don had mentioned, you know, there's some very valid reasons to retain that data for uh, legal compliance, regulatory issues, but and what we see is there's value in that data. So, um, uh, you know, being able to store, there's much more cost-effective ways to do that uh, these days. So, um, finding a way to store it and being able to get it in a form where you can run analysis against it, um, it could fit one of your use cases. Um, and that leads to the second one. It has incredible uh, untapped value. Uh, we see that right across the board from smaller organizations to larger organizations. And so where do you get started is um, you start with one analytic use case. Prove the value and build it up from there. Um, you know, uh, Jeremy mentioned uh, HP Discover. We had a lot of conversations there, and some large organizations were saying, you know, we've been talking about, to give you one quick example, there's a company around the Internet of Things that has quite a few devices connected, you know, millions of them, and the potential is crazy. You know, it's like, okay, we could do predictive maintenance, and we could do, um, you know, things like pay-per-use billing, and you know, there's a bunch of emerging use cases with the Internet of Things, but you can never get off the ground if you don't pick one and say, Where's the one, you know, say let's take uh, large uh, medical equipment devices that have a high cost of downtime, high cost of service. Just focus on that and have a, a, a very um, known use case around predictive maintenance to be able to um, you know, make sure you have higher levels of uptime around those devices and you can meet your SLAs and maybe even charge uh, for those value-added services. So start small, prove the value, and then build on that. Those okay, thank you. <laughs> Jeremy. Uh, actually, uh, kind of build on uh, that advice, which is to say, see the first use case through. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, projects where people will start and uh, then they'll say, oh, well, you know, what's this new NoSQL and HDF or SQL and HDFS technology? Or, you know, maybe we should be using this distro or maybe we should be using this algo, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of chase their tails a little bit. Uh, it is ultimately around the business results. 
So what I would suggest is that these projects have to be run uh, with just as much rigor and alignment and communication as any mainstream uh, technology project to really communicate why you've made certain architectural choices. doesn't matter if something comes out in the meantime. There will always be a fancy new toy. See it through. Uh, demonstrate concrete P&L impact or whatever uh, your operating or financial results are uh, and concentrate on that. It's uh, just uh, it, it's, it's really easy to be uh, you know, looking at uh, engineering uh, elegance and kind of uh, pursue that almost for its own sake. So I, I would say have your initial design and see it through until there's very clear business impact. Okay. Joel, share with us your final thoughts. Okay. What marketing needs to do and what marketing research needs to enable is to flip the funnel. So what I mean by that is marketing has always been encouraged to think of from big to small. Let's think about generating awareness, then we generate interest, desire, and then action. However, if we take what Kellogg's discovered, that by targeting at a zone where we can very precisely target through programmatic advertising, people who are shopping, people who have exactly the interests that we're trying to address, if we can target in the A zone, we're likely to get six times the return. If we target in the B zone, which is contextual, so they're reading articles that indicate that they're interested in a topic that's similar to the values our brand has, that kind of thing, we could probably get about twice the ROI. That means that we target in the C zone, which is, you know, mass marketing, television, radio, we probably are getting about 0.7 or 0.8 times our average return. So why in a programmatic, data-driven era would you not spend as much as you possibly could at targeting in the A zone? Then when you start running out of opportunities for spending your money there, target against the B zone, and then with what's left over, target uh, mass media to round out kind of the reach and awareness you're hoping to achieve. So today we go from big to small, and uh, what we really should be doing is flipping the funnel and working advertising in a data-driven way from small to big. So Excellent. this is an incredible, incredible Great. lead change. And, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I had to cut you short there. Um, we only have uh, a few more minutes. So, um, uh, Don, give me uh, th four seconds of your uh, final thoughts, and then I'll move on to uh, the Jeffs. Okay. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that we come across are people who think they're making use of some of their big data now. Um, but even if you are taking advantage of your uh, data, there's other aspects to consider. So some of it is the value of the data. There's lots of other data sources that you might not be using. What can you do as far as analyzing that? And then realize, too, that the, the time value of, that, of the data in that uh, if we can do some near real-time analysis, you know, maybe you, you're analyzing it, but what could you do if you could get it to it within a couple minutes or a couple of seconds of when it actually occurred? And, um, and then the third one is um, rather than just reporting on what happened, can you actually take that to a couple of the next steps? Can you become predictive? Can you become prescriptive? Can you actually solve the problem rather than just reporting on it or diagnosing it? Okay, excellent. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize to our two other panelists. We're going to have to uh, skip that. And I'm just going to, I know you're all asking the question, how do you get started building your own big data solution? Um, Jeff, give us a, a few uh, thoughts in terms of how IIS can help our customers. Well, again, we, we've been in this business quite a long time, and we've built uh, big data solutions for a number of industries, including financial services, retail, state and local um, as well as others. So uh, the simple message is, is give us a call. Um, simply uh, contact us. We have the expertise and we have the staff that have developed and built these solutions uh, for our clients. We'll come in and we'll, we'll interview you. We'll try to understand your business, your business problems, and then architect and build a solution that will fit and help you monetize your, for your competitive advantage, uh, monetize these data solutions, or monetize your data, uh, provide analytics that will give you a, a competitive advantage in the industry. All right, thank you. 
Well, we had a goal of meeting of the minds, and I'd say we achieved that objective with our panel. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank our audience, and I appreciate the questions. I appreciate your, your participation. This concludes our session. Thank you.